Beware the skull. This is the first in a new seasonal series I'm calling the Autumn Chills Collection. Hi, I'm Irene and you're at the Inkworks studio. I've been wanting to try a skull for a while and I found a suitable reference image at Pixabay. So I drew it in my sketchbook, then redrew it on Arches Cold Pressed watercolor paper. I used a colored pencil for this, a Faber-Castell polychromos. Off to the side are several watercolor pans from my newly assembled Fall Feels palette. By the way, congratulations to viewer AD on winning that item. It will be sent in about a week, and I do hope you have fun playing with it. For this piece, I wanted to limit the color range, so I selected only Hansa Yellow Deep, Raw Umber, and Joseph C's Warm Gray. The paper is 5 by 7. I'd cut it down from a 10 by 14 sheet for a couple of reasons. I didn't want to do this on a grand scale. I'm still sort of new to gouache, so I don't yet feel comfortable using it on large pieces. Also, in the back of my mind, I was still thinking about that 5 by 7 portfolio I've got. In a previous video, I mentioned how I haven't done many pieces in that size, so I figured I'd rectify that. Plus, that gave me four 5 by 7 pieces enough for this Autumn Chills collection. I have several subjects in mind, and the plan for each is to first do a drawing, then add a watercolor underpainting, and lastly, paint with gouache on top of that. Ideally, with at least some of the watercolor work showing in the final piece. Real mixed media stuff. I didn't want there to be any question about which season I was trying to evoke, so I pulled some decor from other spots in the house. The printed skull diagram is from our scary apothecary shelf. The fall leaf is from the vine wreath on our front door, and the pumpkin candle is from our TV stand of terror. I gathered them here for the ambiance. The candle was given to me by good friend Gail. I like to keep such things as decor, but I thought, what the heck, let's light it up. I'd have strewn some candy corn around, but we haven't yet made it to Dollar Tree this season. All three colors were used in the background wash, and while it was still wet, I was able to lift the paint with my brush to create lighter areas. It's the middle of September, and things have finally cooled down a little here in the PNW. It's still not quite sweater weather, but at least our gray skies are back, and I can stop fanning myself with swatch charts. By the way, the initial drawing was done in a new sketchbook that producer Mike found at Walmart. It's from the Pen Plus Gear line, and it's called a Sketch Diary. It's five and a half inches by eight and a half inches, uh, wire bound with 70 sheets, and there's a clear pocket on the front cover. No information on paper weight, so my guess is 60 pounds. It's like two bucks, and it's really convenient having that size around to sketch out ideas as they come. I have a couple of other sketch slash drawing pads, but they are larger format, so they're a bit unwieldy and I can't have them laying by my keyboard. So they end up at the bottom of one of the stacks of stuff next to my drawing table which is probably more than you wanted to know about my current level of organization. Remember those old student desks back in grade school? 
The tops only measured about two feet by three feet and were tiltable, but those things were heavy and tended to slam down and pinch your tiny child fingers. So you had to shove everything inside from the front. Your art projects would get all mangled and squished into the back corners. Yeah, sometimes the inkwork studio feels like one big fourth grade desk. Here comes the gouache as planned. What wasn't planned, though, was forgetting to switch my brushes. I've been using my older brushes from Princeton's Real Value and Snap Lines for use with gouache, and we'd even purchased a new set of three brushes at an affordable price on our last visit to the Artist and Craftsman Supply Store. Totally slipped my mind. I don't know if extended gouache use would harm my best watercolor brushes, but in the back of my mind at least, I'm thinking about how I scrub at dried gouache to reactivate it, and how while cleaning it takes more work to remove gouache from the brush hairs. So yeah, I want to save my best brushes for watercolors, which to me is the more delicate medium. Is that wrong? So I started plopping down dabs of gouache and I didn't really think things through, I guess, because it soon got to a point where it was looking disastrous. Look, I don't often get upset during arting, but this time, the ugly stage seemed to last forever. The inner dialogue was like, it was going so well, too. I should have left it as a watercolor piece. I can't share this. Look at it. Blah, blah, grumble, grumble. It didn't help that I don't have extensive anatomical knowledge, but there's only been one video where I didn't complete the piece, so I think we all know I stuck with this. Which was good, because once I'd blended things a bit, I realized that was a real option, duh, and a way to work the piece around to my liking. So I put in more time and effort than initially intended. While working on this piece, I played some short story audio recordings. One in particular is a favorite of mine, titled Let Loose. 
The story is from 1890, and it was written by Mary Chumley. That's how the reader pronounced the last name anyway. And I'll take his word for it, because it looks like Chomondelay, and that can't be right. The story mostly takes place in an old crypt with piles of bones and skulls, so there's great atmosphere. Throw in a disembodied hand for some chill factor, and you've got a neat little horror story. It's a bit obscure, so I was surprised and delighted to discover the recording. I'd first read Let Loose in my volume of Victorian Ghost Stories by Eminent Women Writers. Other books I cherish are a hardbound edition of a Weird Tales anthology and Murder, Inc. That last one is full of essays about the mystery and crime fiction genres. They're all looking a bit worn with yellowed paper. For a long time, I kept them stacked and displayed in the powder room. You know, to creep people out, as one does. For the finer detailing, I finally remembered I had other brushes and pulled out a number two round snap. There are worse things than mixing up brushes. Take this morning, for instance. I didn't want to go to the trouble of brewing a pot of coffee, so I went to grab a tea bag instead, only to discover I'm out of constant comment. That's a real artist problem there. How am I to straddle that fine line between somnolent and frantic while voiceovering? Chamomile doesn't cut it. Give that to me at midnight, not noon when I'm trying to be productive. That's right, it takes maintenance to keep this show voice from turning into hard living Vera at the greasy diner. What can I get for you, sweetie? Often when I see a skull, I flash back to my childhood when they used to show old horror films on TV. There was a lot of Vincent Price and Peter Cushing, and I suppose there were plenty of skeletons as well, but I'm certain I once saw a Peter Cushing movie actually titled The Skull. But beyond the image of a floating skull surrounded by mist, I don't recall much about it. I expect a lot of people know Peter Cushing mostly from his role in the original Star Wars movie, but I remember him best from several of my favorite horror anthology films. Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, The House That Dripped Blood, and Asylum. Wow, that was a lot of shudders in one sentence. Even I don't watch all three movies in succession. Best to spread them out over a week at least. That reminds me, we used to plan our scary movie viewing for October. It was usually five to ten of our favorite horror films, ones we enjoyed re-watching every year. But these days, we mostly just pick from whatever is streaming at the time. Van Helsing is a favorite because it was the DVD producer Mike and I watched on our first date, and at least one of us fell asleep partway through. Thus began our long history of nodding off during movies. For anyone who was worried about the lit candle, it was sitting on a coaster the entire time and was never left unattended. I did extinguish it, though, because hot wax dripped down onto the fabric placemat. Yeah, apparently the coaster wasn't quite big enough. So now there's a clump of orange wax stuck to one of my scene-setting props. I thought I could just pull it off, but no, it does not want to come off. It's like some malignant alien parasite. 
Although I'd removed the tape thinking the piece was finished, several things were bugging me, so I went back in for a few touch-ups. One thing I want to mention is that while I was mixing gouache colors, I spent quite a while trying to get just the right shade of tan, adding a pinch of this and a smidge of that. Then I dabbed in a dot of carmine and BAM! It was Blood City. So be careful when adding red gouache to your mixes. It's potent. I am happy to share this mixed media painting. This is one piece that's not getting shoved into a corner. If only because of all the time I spent on it. Until next time, don't panic before you've even begun to blend. And stay artsy, my friends.